Globally, 80% of wastewater is returned to the environment without being treated, let alone to a level where it can be reused. According to the University of Arizona's Water Resources Research Center, between 60 to 65% of the water that goes down a home's drain has the potential to be reused. Unfortunately, our current wastewater treatment procedures tend to be poorly optimized and cause hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost energy and chemicals. Greetings, my name is Mike Lake and I am your host. Today, we are talking to Mike Dixon, CEO of Sonata, a solution to treat water using less energy and less chemicals. Innovation, resiliency, discovery. Join Mike Lake, President and CEO of Leading Cities, as we explore the technologies shaping the possibilities of our future with a preview of tomorrow. Hello and welcome, Mike. It's so good to have you here today on uh, Preview of Tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, I want to thank all of our listeners and viewers for tuning in to this episode. Um, today, I have the privilege of introducing you to Mike Dixon. He is the CEO of Sonata. It's a company that streamlines the processes of desalination and water reuse plants by using supervised machine learning to optimize energy and chemical use for specific conditions. Now, Mike, there's a lot to that. I mean, just the, the issue alone, there's a lot to unpack. But tell us, first of all, a little bit more about yourself and, and how did you come to, to be the CEO of Sonata? Well, thanks. First of all, thanks so much for having me here today, Mike. Uh, so a little bit about my background and then into Sonata. Um, I've always worked in the water industry. Uh, I've been working in the industry for almost 20 years now in my career. And uh, initially I started in Australia. Uh, I worked for a quite, quite a large desalination plant as part of a push to bring Australia out of uh, the millennium drought over there in mm -hmm. around 2000. Uh, 2005 through 2010, we installed six major desalination plants all around the country. Uh, so that really helped me understand, uh, one, what it's like to live in a dry place that doesn't have enough water, uh, and two, uh, to really build my career around desalination. Uh, after that, I moved to the United States, to California, uh, to work for a startup called Nano H2O, which was extremely successful. Uh, the company uh, exited for around $200 million uh, to LG Chem. And finally, I moved up to Alberta as uh, I wanted to experience Canada and uh, learn more about the water situation up here and a lot more about startups, uh, working with some accelerators. Uh, and through that time, I started thinking about certain um, business models in the water industry and what was working at the time and what was not working at the time. And it helped lead me to think about Sonata and uh, what really needed to be done in the desalination industry uh, to start moving things forward into new technologies that can really add value uh, to our industry. So that's a little bit about me and uh, a very little bit about Sonata as well. Well, and you are obviously in the right industry. Uh, I mean, this is an industry that is is just critical. To, I mean, it's critical to human survival. Um, and yet we're facing, uh, as you I'm sure know, and we have said on, on this podcast on previous occasions that look, despite the fact that the world, the majority of the world is covered in water, there is less than 1% or about 1% of it is actually drinkable. Um, and that is is really under threat. Um, some predicting that in, in less than 20 years, we might not have any um, drinkable water uh, available. Exactly, exactly. So you can see how much of a critical issue desalination and water reuse is becoming. Uh, so in certain parts of the world, they've done this really, really well. Uh, in the last week, I've been attending a conference uh, online from Singapore called Singapore International Water Week. Those guys in particular have done things really, really well. So there they think about four national taps. Uh, they think about reuse and desalination. They think about groundwater, uh, as well as the water that naturally falls and gets collected in reservoirs. Uh, so the key thing for other places that they can learn from places like Singapore and California, 
uh, as well, is thinking about new and other sources of water. So desalination and water reuse really helps out in this regard and means we can expand upon that. Only 1% of the world's water is fresh uh, and be able to continue to grow cities uh, and not have the threat of running out of water. Uh, and this is common around the world, running out of water. A couple of years back, um, South Africa had some major issues wow. um, saying they only had days worth of water left in their reservoirs before running out. And of course, now they've turned to a climate independent source of water. And the only true one is desalination uh, and also be, um, bulked up the amount of water reuse that they do uh, to try and keep whatever falls at, or is created by desalination um, in their uh, catchment system and to be reused. Uh, places like Israel around the world uh, is really good at reusing their water. Uh, they re reuse as much as 90% of their water, uh, being an extremely dry place. So we can learn things in less dry places uh, to see what's coming in the future and, and what can we really do. Well, you know, the, be, living here in Boston, as is in, in many places, you know, you, we turn so easily, turn on that tap and, and water just flows so easily. So we take it for granted. Um, it is not that way in much of the world. In fact, I know that there's more than 20,000 desalination plants uh, around the world, and, and that's really serving a, a huge part, portion of the population, 5% of the world's population, I think. So clearly desalination is, is part of the answer here, but you mentioned something else I want to drill down on a little bit, which is reuse, because um, that's something all of us can be doing better. Um, exactly. The idea that some communities, you know, reusing 90% of their water is is tremendous. Um, what potential do we have? Uh, like, how much of the water we use, um, or I'll, I'll say consume, uh, could actually be reused? Um, quite a lot, uh, actually. Um, so. Um, in places like California as well, um, they also reuse uh, a larger percentage. Um, a really great idea to start along the reuse track is to start using uh, or reusing water for industrial applications, uh, where the risk to uh, human health is rather low. Um, so it's been done for so many years now that the risks are actually quite low and there are so many barriers in place that several barriers in the treatment process can fail and you still have enough barriers in place to protect human health. But to, to just dip our toe in the water, so to speak, in reuse, the best thing to do for any city is to start using it in industrial situations. And to begin with, that might mean just a couple of factories uh, around town just starting to do a little bit of reuse internally on their sites. Uh, and over the years, building up to say, okay, now we can do um, reuse of mun municipal water. Uh, in the water industry, we talk about two different types of reuse, um, a direct potable reuse and an indirect potable reuse. So most places do indirect. Um, they take the water and treat it through these barriers, and then they put it into an aquifer underground once it's clean to give it six months lifetime underground for that further cleaning process and removal of any contaminants before bringing it up again and using it for things like um, watering lawns or um, uh, agriculture, those kind of things. Sure. Uh, so direct potable reuse is used less around the world, uh, but as we progress globally, um, cities will be able to do that direct reuse and really bring up the amount of water that they reuse and therefore can keep that water from flowing out to sea if they're on the coast uh, or just being wasted in general. Uh, around the home, we can do things as well. I personally remember during the millennium drought in Australia, we were encouraged to uh, do things like capture water in the shower. I only have three minute showers, capture some of that water and use that on our lawn instead mm. of uh, using water from the, the hose pipe. Uh, so there's things you can do personally as well to help the situation. So let's talk now about Sonata a bit because you, you are tackling this challenge and it's, it, I think it's really, um, I mean, the work you're doing is, is incredible. So 
explain to our, our listeners and viewers what is Sonata and, and how do you operate? Sure. So during my career in water, uh, I've got to visit a lot of water treatment plants, desalination, reuse plants all around the world. And in previous jobs, my role was to look over data from the plant and understand what was going on. And every time I looked at the data, I thought, wow, this plant could be just run so much better and it could save hundreds of thousands of dollars, even into the millions of dollars, if they just tweak this and tune that a little bit here and there. Uh, so learning from that experience, um, we, uh, I learned more about artificial intelligence. Uh, so actually I was on vacation and reading Isaac Asimov novels. And he talks a lot about artificial intelligence, and robots, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, and it has inspired me to learn more about artificial intelligence. Uh, and so as I was learning about it, I thought, wow, these two things really go together, like the optimization of desalination and artificial intelligence, because it means then that operators of the plant um, don't have to think about things. Uh, they can do the things that they love to do uh, without having to focus too much uh, on um, optimizing the plant. Uh, so that's a little bit about Sonata. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do in a nutshell is we want to save desalination plants up to 20% of their OPEX costs by using artificial intelligence to save on energy use and on chemical use as well. And, and of course, that has a, not only is it making the, the the water industry that much more efficient, but it also has its environmental impacts as well. It has a huge environmental impact. Uh, so we had the Global Engineers GHD have a look at what we're doing, and they found that we could save as much as 12 million tons of CO2 every single year. So the impact of using artificial intelligence for this process optimization can really be huge. And for cities as well, it really goes beyond water. And if they think about optimizing all of the processes through what they do, uh, we looked at utilities more broadly and said, if you combine water and power, you could be saving you know, over 150, um, 150 million tons of CO2 every year. So the impact is really, really huge by applying artificial intelligence to solve optimization problems. It is, it's incredible how much energy is, is used to, to clean or, or treat our, our water. Um, and especially, as I said before, with so many desalination plants around the world, so it, you collect, collectively, it's a massive, massive amount of energy that's being Absolutely. used. Um, so what, do you have a sense, I mean, of, of the energy costs as it relates to desalination plants? You know, how, how significant is that to a particular plant? Sure. Um, so it's in the order of 5 to 10% savings of their energy. And huh. given that energy on a desalination plant is usually between 40 to 60% of their OPEX costs, uh, it represents a really big cost for them. And in municipalities, um, they're trying to do things, you know, as cost effectively as possible. And so that can make a huge impact. Uh, we did a study of an Australian uh, plant, uh, just a theoretical a theoretical study and said, look, if we can save them 10%, um, this particular plant in Australia could be saving in the order of $3 million every single year. Uh, so that has a huge impact on the bottom line uh, of quite a few large municipalities uh, and a real value for them. And, and that only gets compounded when, as we said at the beginning, that you know, demand as our population increases, demand for potable water only increasing and the availability of it only decreasing, <laughs> um, or at least exactly fresh water. Right. You know? Exactly so. right. Yeah. So at Sonoda, we believe that uh, we don't necessarily have to be installing like all these new huge plants around the world. We can be more efficient with what we have. Um, so given that we work on optimization, uh, efficiency is really key for us. Uh, so really what, what we want to see around the world is uh, more efficient, uh, more efficiency everywhere. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to lead the way um, within our industry 
helping people think about how can we be more efficient and what are the things we can do. I, I think artificial intelligence is just the beginning of thinking about um, how can we do more with less. So uh, let me ask you this. If we look out you know, into the future, 25, 50 years down the road, um, and Sonata is operating in, in all of the desalination plants that, and or um, water plants uh, that you can think of, what does that actually mean? What does it mean whether it's to the individual or to a society or, or to the environment? Uh, what I think it means is that we'll be working a whole lot more efficiently all around the world. Uh, like I mentioned, we can be doing more with less. Uh, and I think it really resonates uh, with what Sonata's vision is in that we live in a world where water and energy is not wasted. Because uh, the two things go hand in hand. Um, just because we're drinking water doesn't mean it's not taking energy. Um, sometimes you can think about saving water as being um, energy saving as well. Uh, so key to us is that we see that uh, CO2 emissions all around the world uh, will be reduced, just like we were talking about, that 12 million tonnes uh, of reduction. Uh, and what we really want to see is that communities around the world uh, are, are avoiding things like water restrictions that I was talking about, uh, or avoiding uh, in places like Africa, having to move away from where they are simply because there's not enough water where they are. Uh, or it gets much worse, is that we want to see avoided in the, that 30, 40, 50 years time is fighting wars over water. We're getting to the point where the fresh water is so scarce that there is the potential later down the track to be fighting wars over water. Uh, so we hope that in that amount of time that people will see reuse as a fantastic situation uh, and it will be perfectly obvious for everyone to reuse their water. Uh, and we'd like to see that cities be all thinking about what's a climate independent way of creating water and if they're on the coast, uh, thinking about seawater desalination uh, and really making it um, that full four national taps like Singapore thinks about, that full collective strategy about how do I create enough water so that everyone in the city has enough water uh, and that we're not fighting wars around the world uh, over what we have. Well, it is amazing what you've done, and unfortunately, we're, we're now out of time, but I do want to thank you for taking the time to join us today on Preview of Tomorrow, and thank you for the work you're doing. I mean, from reducing the cost uh, of treating our water to reducing the carbon emissions to reducing the waste of the good water that we have. I can't thank you enough for all of your efforts. Thanks very much, Mike. It was really good chatting to you today. Likewise. And thank you for tuning in to this episode of Preview of Tomorrow. Listeners like you are essential to advancing our efforts to drive resiliency and sustainability for all. I ask that you give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever streaming platform you prefer. Your feedback helps us to grow and share these brief previews of what life in the future can be. In addition to thanking our guests today, I want to thank Peter Roy and Demetria Bridges for making this podcast possible. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and encourage others to also join us each week in previewing the possibilities of tomorrow. Preview of Tomorrow is brought to you by Leading Cities, a global nonprofit driving resilience and sustainability for all by unleashing the potential of the world's cities. Join them at leadingcities.org.